In the northwest of the known world is a land of wonder and wizardry, a land that has exploited an alien power, known only as the Radiance, to enable fantastic feats of sorcery that rival the Alphatian Empire. A federation of ten principalities ruled by a council of wizards, Glantry is a majocracy, a land ruled by magic users and elves, and the destination for many a wandering spellcaster, desperate to learn the secret of Glantry's great school of magic. Leave your holy symbols at the door though, for this is a land where you can get executed just for being a man of faith. Hi, I'm Bake Me Berserker and welcome back to my channel. It's time to explore the third of the gazetteers that supported the known world, the Beck Me Dungeons & Dragons campaign world. Today we'll be looking at Gaz 3, the Principalities of Glantry, a land steeped in magic, mystery and immortal power. If you're new here, then welcome. This is where we explore the Beck Me edition of Dungeons & Dragons, released between 1983 and 1986 in five boxed sets, and also as an amalgamated rulebook called the Rules Cyclopedia in 1991. If you wish to know more about Beckme, then please follow the link on the screen to my Beckme playlist. Gaz 3, The Principalities of Glantry, was written by Bruce Hurd and published by TSR in 1987. It was a softcover book and had 96 pages. That's 32 more pages than the previous two Gazetteers, an obvious indication that this publication had more content. The cover art was once again by Clyde Caldwell, utilising shades of green alongside mystical runes and a lightning-wielding sorceress to evoke a sense of wonder. And in the middle of it all is the menacing gaze of what might be one of the wizard princes, daring you to open this tome to learn its secrets. Truly unsettling. Gaz 3 The Principalities of Glantry was accompanied by an A1-sized colour map of the land, detailing the borders of each principality, like the previous gazetteers, the cover separated from the main book, but this had only two panels as opposed to the three that were present with Gaz 1 and Gaz 2, with the player's map of where the country being discussed was in relation to other countries being absent. However, the entirety of the reverse of the A1 map was taken up with an illustration of Glantry City, which could be shared with players, meaning this gazetteer actually came with two A1 colour maps, more than compensating for that missing third panel. Examining the A1 map of the Principalities more closely, it included maps of two villages named Trinton and Lamsa, as well as a map of Skullhorn Pass, which is a camp bordering the Athengar Khanate. Unfortunately, the map of the land suffers from the same poor contrasting of text against the colourful background we've seen in previous gazetteers, but crucially also lacks a scale to tell the reader what distance one hex represents. I know this to be 8 miles per hex based on my previous readings, but if I didn't have that information then I would be quite lost in terms of understanding how big Glantry was. It's a shame this information is absent, and given this information was also absent from Gaz 2, it makes me a little apprehensive about subsequent Gazetteer releases. The inside book cover contained top-down perspective illustrations of a generic wizard's keep and the Great School of Magic with some cursory labelling to help Dungeon Masters facilitate play if characters are exploring these places. Beyond this, they are interesting concept art in terms of communicating what Glantry architecture is like and what may be expected when exploring structures in Glantry City. But as we will see, architecture follows numerous cultural influences in the Principalities due to its rather diverse, if still mainly human, population. Due to the size of this publication, the contents of the book were separated into numerous chapters, but essentially the first few cover Glantry's history, geography and economy, which includes a specific focus on running dominions in Glantry. We then have three chapters focusing on the main personalities and organisations of the land, which is encouraging and an indication that the reader will be offered intriguing context for running their campaign. The next two chapters are 20 pages about Glantry City, Together with the A1 player's map, this promises a fascinating insight into the machinations of the city. We then have a further four chapters focusing on spellcasting, magic item creation, specific Glantrian wizard pathways that might be explored, referred to as secret crafts, and a behind-the-curtain look at what is the Radiance. The final few chapters make up 17 pages of information for adventuring and campaigning in the Principalities, 
including specific creatures that characters might come across and impressions about the principalities by outsiders. Turning to my first impressions of this book, visually it is clearly good value for money, especially given the increased page count, the cover art and the extra A1 map. However, a cursory leaf through it makes it clear that the delivery of its content differs quite a bit from the previous two gazetteers. Specifically, its language is much more colloquial, with much information being communicated via story-based conversational passages rather than directly, which suggests information to be available to the players. This is supported by passages specific to the DM, which helps consolidate player information and contextualize it. My immediate thought was that this method seems quite indulgent, and perhaps the main reason for the increased page count, instead of that reason being for more content. But let's get into it and I'll see how I feel at the end. I think the first thing to say about this particular gazette here is how it's framed. On the first page we are introduced to a section called the final goal of the campaign, which actually turns out to be three goals. It's clear from this passage that this book is written to facilitate a conclusion to a campaign arc based in the principalities of Glantry. These three goals are to offer a potential route to immortality, clearly an offer for long-term play, to offer new and exciting ways to play magic users and elves, together with a new way of rewarding them experience points, and finally to offer a campaign environment where magic is dominant and prominent, including how wizards may become rulers of dominions. Ultimately, the objective of Gaz 3, the Principalities of Glantry, seems to be to offer dungeon masters and players a framework for playing a wizard beyond just adventuring and collecting knowledge. The Land of Glantry is clearly the vehicle for doing this, with the added benefit of offering the reader information about yet another interesting nation within the known world. So after all that, what is the Principalities of Glantry? How did it come to be? Why are its cultures so diverse? Well, let's have a look at its geography and then its timeline to see how the nation emerged to be what it is today. The Principalities of Glantry is mostly made up of mountainous areas, such as the Wendarian Reaches in the north, the Colossus Mounts in the east, the Glantrian Alps and Silver Sierra in the south, and the vast Kurish Massif in the west, which extends into the Sindh Desert. Numerous volcanoes dot these ranges, which are themselves, for the most part, preceded by miles of foothills. Carving their way through these features are many rivers that flow swiftly from the high altitude of the mountain ranges, often via deadly rapids, to drain into beautiful valleys where most of the population of Glantry live and work. Because of this concentration of population within the valleys, human activity has all but driven monstrous wildlife to the hills and mountains, which have been known to house numerous lycanthropes. Griffins are known to make opportunist attempts to hunt amongst exposed horse herds, and it's not unusual to spot the odd rock or two. That said, creatures such as trolls, ogres, dragons and manticore are known to inhabit or live near sparsely populated areas, and only the foolhardy go seeking them, or the desperate merchants seeking rare ingredients for the market in Glantry City. Speaking of Glantry City, it stands where the Isoil River joins with the Fasubia as it flows south on its way into the Broken Lands. Home to the Great School of Magic, and the centre of the Radiance, it is where all aspiring wizards wish to live. But if you wish to rule, you must earn the right to a dominion this close to the Radiance. And if you wish to become a wizard prince, well, you'd better brush up on your politics. The weather in the Principalities ranges from mild in summer to extremely cold in the winter, mainly due to the altitude of much of the country. Many mountain passes and rivers become unnavigable in the frigid cold, but when the thaw comes, it is the main cause of the rapids I mentioned earlier. Due to the low valleys and proximity of surrounding hills and mountains, mist and fog are common in warmer months, and hail is a particular feature of Glantry's precipitation, with damage to buildings from the hailstones being commonplace, leading to most mountain homes not having windows. The country that is called the Principalities of Glantry is fairly new in respect of its formation, there are tales of elven migration into the area following the obliteration of a legendary place called Blackmoor many thousands of years before, but these fled following what's referred to as a local cataclysm that had a devastating effect on the area. What's important to know is that the destruction of Blackmoor caused a temporary ice age that covered the land that is now known as Glantry. The ice did not recede until around 800 BC, 
leaving behind the gouged and mountainous geology I described earlier. There is little information about events in this area until 395 AC, a significant gap, but which culminated with the arrival of a new race occupying the valleys. This group of people called themselves the Flaum, meaning followers of the fire in their language, and were of copper complexion and had reddish hair. I'll not delve into their origin for the sake of spoilers, but suffice to say, they were already a civilized race and talented in the use of magic. For game mechanic purposes, the Flaum are identical to humans. Around 450 AC, the Flaum discovered a radiating magical force near the intersection of the Asoil and the Fasubia rivers. Identifying the positive effect it had on their spell use, they built a city over the location and called it Brea. Rumours of this magical radiance spread across the known world, causing a migration of Elven, Traladaran and Thiatian settlers. Some of the Elves believed they were returning to claim their lost realm. This would lead to frictions later, but in the intervening years, the Flaum were forced to deal with incursions from Ethengar raiders in the east, beginning in 585 AC and resulting in the Khan's horsemen being driven out. Sixty years later, in 645, Athenga attempted a major invasion, but this was defeated at Skullhorn Pass. Apparently wanting to eliminate the Athengar threat, the Flaum conducted a counter-invasion in 662 AC, leading to their entire expeditionary force being massacred. Clearly the geography and tactics of both civilizations were a major factor here, but the Flamish defeat put an end to open hostilities, although relations between Athengar and Glantry remain tense today. Divisions between the Flaum and migrating settlers continue to grow, and the death of a Flamish lord at the hands of a Thiatian settler resulted in the Flaum declaring war on all settlers in 784 AC. This led to the Battle of Brea in 785, which drove the settlers south, towards the border. However, events took a turn with the arrival of Halzunthrum, a leader of Alphasian colonizers, who sided with the settlers and led them to victory in the Battle of Brastar in 788. Halzunthrum then revealed his overarching allegiances and declared the territory for the Alphasian Empire, causing his once elven allies to proclaim independence, enabling the defeated Flaum to rebel. But now with the support of the Thiatian settlers, they had just been at war with. A great example of an enemy of my enemy is my friend, if ever you wanted one. This conflict became known as the Forty Years' War. During this time, rumours of a gold rush in the eastern mountains in 802 AC attracted bands of lawless dwarves to the area. This corresponded with the emergence of a plague, which the dwarves were suspiciously resistant to. This led to the dwarves being hunted down and killed wherever they could be found, during a period that is now referred to as the Years of Infamy. During one such hunt in 828 AC, a Thiatian hero named Lord Alexander Glantry ambushed Halzunthrum, causing the Alphatian faction to surrender. Glantry ended the Forty Years' War, and ushered in a period of peace, recognising the rights of all communities, and Brea was renamed Glantry City. Lord Alexander founded the Republic of Glantry and reformed the council, which in 845 began construction of the Great School of Magic. Over the intervening years, wizards began to occupy a majority of influence in Glantry, leading to a parliamentary session which historians refer to as the Light of Rad in 858. During this session, laws were passed that nobility may only be occupied by wizards and that council members could now receive the hereditary title of prince. This resulted in a rebellion which was crushed in 859, leaving the way open for the newly formed Principalities of Glantry to implement its regime focused on the official philosophy of magic. Religion became a crime of high treason, where clerical practice was now punishable by death. The Great School of Magic was completed in 875, attracting new migrants from across the known world. Today it is 1000 AC. Glantry has successfully grown its economy via trade agreements with the nearby mercantile Republic of Darakin. The use of magic is central to how Glantry operates, but not all of its princes pull in the same direction, and things are far from ideal within the council and without. If the principalities could organise themselves to work together, the true power of the country might be realised. 
The result of this history on the population of Glantry is that it is a veritable mix of peoples. Although dwarves and halflings remain conspicuously absent due to their resistance to magic being perversely experimented upon whenever one can be got hold of. Many people of Flamish descent operate effectively at all levels of Glantrian society, and even the elven communities appear conducive for now. So with that bit of potted history out of the way, what are the ten principalities of Glantry? Who are the wizard princes that govern them? And how does it all work? And what's all this got to do with the Radiance? Well, I've listed the ten principalities for you here, together with their populations and their monetary worth in terms of net income, which is in crowns. I'll get to what this means in a moment. The Gazetteer goes into some detail about each of these principalities in terms of their specialisms, products, traditions, and economic contributions. This enables dungeon masters to understand the differences between these areas and communicate a land to players that is both cosmopolitan and effervescent. Since the subject of income has come up, let me digress a moment into Glantry coinage, because it differs somewhat from the standard, and even more so from previous gazetteers. In order of value, the platinum piece is called a crown, a gold piece is called a ducat, a silver piece is called a sovereign, and a copper piece is called a penny. Electrum is not minted in Glantry. What's interesting is that the values of some of these differ from the standard Beckme rules. We are told that the gold ducat is close to the value of foreign gold pieces. I would take this to mean the same as, as what close means is neither here nor there. However, we are told that the platinum crown is worth 50 ducats, each one containing a magical duema that causes them to glow brightly. We are also told that if this duema is dispelled, then the value of the crown is reduced to only 5 ducats. In my opinion, this is an unnecessary flourish in terms of world building, and I would be tempted to get rid of the whole idea of a Dwemer and just say that Platinum Mine from the Glantry Mountains has a shinier appearance, perhaps caused by the Radiance. I think this makes more sense, and it seems strange for there to be a chance to potentially impoverish a nation just by casting Dispel Magic on a pile of coins. Turning to the Silver Sovereign, we are told that it is worth one-tenth of a Ducat, which follows the standard Beckme rules. However, the Copper Penny is worth one-twentieth of a Ducat, but this is justified by the fact that Glantry pennies are five times bigger than foreign copper coins. So after that quick digression, we can see that these net incomes are in crowns, so platinum. Therefore the gold piece, or ducat value, would be obtained by multiplying each of these values by 50. Substantial amounts, I think you would agree. You may spot that some of the names of these principalities have leanings to specific European cultures, and you wouldn't be wrong. Indeed, there are clear attempts to draw parallels with Italian, Spanish, Bohemian, French, and even Scottish cultures, just to name a few. In my opinion, this approach was heavily influenced by the inclusion of the reference to Avawine, which is a fictional French province created by American writer Clark Ashton Smith in the 1930s to support his fantasy stories. Avawine first got a mention in D&D through the 1981 module X2 Castle Amber, Chateau d'Amberville, by Tom Moldvay, which happened to be set in Glantry. And what a great illustration by Errol Otis, by the way. I don't want to give away too much in case some viewers are playing in Glantry at the moment, but suffice to say that the Principality of New Averroine leans heavily on the original source material, and may have influenced Bruce Hurd to also include other European cultural references, hence these names. I can't really think of another reason for them to be here in this way, but let me know what you think in the comments. After introducing us to these principalities and information about them, the Gazetteer offers us the ruling houses of these Glantry principalities and who their wizard princes are. I have expanded the table here to show you them. Please pause the video if you wish to examine this more closely. In addition, we are offered information on house politics, specifically their webs of intrigue, and also given sidebar information about the function of nobility, including how one might become a noble, utilising a parliamentary voting mechanic, and something called the Order of the Radiance, which becomes central to attaining political power and, potentially, immortality. I'll come back to this a bit later. This is an excellent bit of reading. Hurd uses the colloquial method I mentioned earlier to build a picture of a chaotic council in session and introduces us to a cast of characters and how they interact with each other. 
Each house is broken down as follows so that we can learn more about it and its political leanings. We have its ruler, the wizard prince or princess, their siege, an archaic term for a seat of power but basically the name of the principality and its capital, which also happens to be the house name. We have the house alignment, which is expanded beyond the usual lawful, neutral and chaotic to give it a bit more flavour in terms of the behaviour you might expect from members of the house. We have an intriguing bit of text labelled voting power, which supports the parliamentary voting mechanic I mentioned earlier. We have family, which is a who's who of active family members within house politics. We are given the house's allies and we are given its foes, both of which help frame the family's interactions with others and the potential consequences of these. In addition to this list, we are offered the origins of each family, some of which is quite surprising, and get the gears working in terms of what you might do with such information. Finally, we are offered information about what ties a family has with others. This can be both positive and negative, and is supported with reasons why, which from what I can tell are consistent with information throughout the book. As if this wasn't enough, Gaz 3 gives us one of the strongest chapters in the book, called Marauders, Mages and Masters which is 11 pages of NPCs, their descriptions, stats, motivations, machinations, ambitions, and secrets. I counted 60 NPC stats and descriptions in all, in just this chapter, but these were just the key ones. Within their descriptions are references to other characters, such as family members, each with a suggested class, level, and alignment. I began counting these, which together with what I counted earlier, went well beyond 100, before I thought it pointless to continue. The point has been made. The chapter is a treasure trove of personalities and intrigue. Investing time in this chapter can enable dungeon masters to answer any questions players throw at them. And I came away from it thinking that one could quite easily get a Game of Thrones vibe from all the politicking and deceit going on. And for added value, each of the prince and princess descriptions is accompanied by a portrait sketch, which is a useful addition although I did wonder how Ron Jeremy got here. Let's go back a bit to attaining political power in Glantry. By law, only wizards are allowed to become nobles, and we are told that this may be from ninth level once a character has performed a great deed for the council or graduated from the Great School of Magic. This is where the voting mechanic comes in. It may become important which families the character has been working for or has allegiances with, hence a family's voting power. As I alluded to earlier, when working for one group, you are likely to be working against another, either directly or indirectly. Therefore, obtaining nobility is a tricky prospect. That said, once achieved, higher ranks of nobility may become available, either through deeds or seats vacated through the demise of previous nobles. Again, the voting system is important here, but what also comes into play is the Order of the Radiance, which should always be at the front of an ambitious wizard mind. The higher the rank of a noble, the closer they are allowed dominion in proximity to the Radiance, improving their ability to access its power. Thus, baronies may not be closer than 180 miles, by counties 120 miles, counties 80 miles, marquisates 50 miles, duchies 40 miles, and archduchies or grand duchies at 30 miles. No dominions are allowed within 30 miles of the capital, and therefore no family has dominion over the capital. It's worth stating that the entire country is not accounted for within the ten principalities. Numerous, what are called, free territories are dotted throughout the land, meaning there is plenty of opportunity for ambitious wizards wanting to own land. In lieu of any other authority, these free territories are administered by the council directly. But given that it is rare for the council to agree on anything, they are very much left to get on with things. So here we can see the mechanic, if you will, for supporting a campaign in Glantry. We have a system for obtaining power, based on a political stage, on which a character's rank and influence can be measured through their proximity to Glantry City, otherwise known as the Order of the Radiance. Through clever play and a good deal of luck, it's not impossible for a character to obtain territory and potentially become an 11th Wizard Prince. As if all of this wasn't enough of a backdrop for running a campaign in Glantry, we are offered seven pages of a chapter on guilds and brotherhoods. Thirty guilds and brotherhoods, to be precise. Each one accompanied by information on their alignment, these not being the same as character alignments, their status in Glantry, and the fees required to join and remain a member. 
In addition, we are given background information on each organization, such as its aims and objectives, and how far along these are, and any obstacles having to be overcome. I've read through this chapter a number of times whilst putting this video together for you, and each time my mind begins to build new adventures for player groups I only wish I had time for. For example, I don't think I'm spoiling too much by revealing the Free Fundamentalist Farmers, a group dedicated to upsetting the possibility of their lands being enfiefed to a noble. Working closely with allies, who I'll not reveal, they organise to upset any notions of local people calling for an act of enfiefment, that is, a vote for a noble to rule over them. One could view their cause as noble in and of itself, so as to protect the affairs of independent landowners. Or one could view them as an intimidating and bullying group, looking after their own interests at the expense of the wishes of the wider population. My mind can't help but think of all kinds of low-level adventures where characters are sent by a rich noble to deal with intimidatory tactics in the area, but later learn that the noble has ambitions to obtain the land for himself. Some residents don't mind, some residents do. Who will the characters end up supporting and upsetting? Don't know, that's completely up to them but it smacks of the kind of moral dilemma I love inserting into my games. The Guilds and Brotherhoods chapter is full of stuff like this, much of which is kept secret from players until such a time as it should be revealed. Honestly, this chapter makes me wish I'd used this book a lot more in the past. So, we've now got an incredible backdrop for the Principalities of Glantry and how it works, both legally and illegally. Armed with this knowledge, the Gazetteer steers us into 20 pages about the city of Glantry itself, Bruce Hurd uses the colloquial style once again by taking us on a tour of the city at night using a high-profile NPC to do this, and introducing us to the city's different quarters. This is when the A1 player's map comes into its own. Most of the buildings on this map are keyed to the Gazetteer, and the Dungeon Master is aided by wonderful sketches of each quarter, so that there is no confusion about which quarter contains which buildings. Descriptions of each location are extremely informative, with each one I would say averaging 100 words. However, it's what these locations are that mark Glantry City out as a place of magic and weirdness. For example, there's the Monster Handlers Syndicate for keeping monsters or monster bits for magical ingredients, supported by a Monster Hunters Union, where information about certain monsters can be obtained. There's the Guild of Thugs, the People's Spellcasters Company, Game Lizards Incorporated, and Magic for Sale. Each description offers insight into the occupier and their ambitions and affiliations, once again joining the dots with the intrigue we've become familiar with as we've explored this great country. The practicalities of living in Glantry are brought together in several pages detailing tax and cost obligations for certain activities, such as this sale of private spellcasting or even just wearing armour. And we are also introduced to key laws of Glantry, broken down into treason, felonies and misdemeanours. Out of all the laws, the one that is of most interest is that religion is a crime of high treason. This means that anyone playing a cleric in Glantry must be extremely careful, for being caught is punishable by burning. Even the act of religious worship attracts a terrible punishment in the form of torture by black pudding exposure, followed by a life imprisonment at the Tower of Sighs within Glantry City. Why is religion a crime? Well, the only explanation I could find was that only the official philosophy of magic is acceptable. This manifests as what is referred to as a form of spirituality, where introspection is used by wizards to seek guidance from who they refer to as Rad. Perhaps a reference to the Radiance, perhaps not. There are numerous temples of Rad, dotted throughout Glantry, each one occupied by wizards called Shepherds of Rad, who sometimes believe they are being communicated to by Rad himself. Who or what Rad is can be a key component to your campaign. That said, in my opinion, the worship of Rad seems a religion under another name, one that does not bestow clerical spells, but operates in a similar manner. Maybe the point of this irony is to demonstrate the controlling effect religion can have on one's worldview, and that fundamentalism can be found in the denial of religion just as much as in its practice. One more aspect of living in Glantry I want to highlight is its calendar. Glantry uses the Thiatian calendar we saw in Gaz 1. 
However, we are treated to an expansion of detail in the form of holidays or dates of note that are found throughout the land at different times of year. This is an excellent bit of world building that brings Glantry to life. A dungeon master keeping track of the date can really bring colour to the environment in players' imaginations, just through the activities of Glantry's citizens. Reading through some of these, there are obvious real-world parallels which link to the European aspect I mentioned earlier, but for me, this just strengthens the backdrop, as I'm able to understand the cultural references and make sense of what might otherwise seem nonsensical. Who am I kidding? They're mostly nonsensical, but they're fun. Well, we've navigated the political minefield of Glantry society and walked the streets of Glantry city, but now it's time to go to school. Not just any school, though. We're going to the Great School of Magic. The Great School of Magic offers the magic user and elf class the opportunity to obtain spells for each level gained, and also extra abilities through what are called complementary courses. Persistent attendance to the school is not required. You may take breaks for adventuring and gaining experience before returning to pay for studies that will result in the character receiving spells, and potentially an ability gained from a course. It's important to mention here that in Beckme Dungeons & Dragons, magic users and elves can only use spells that they have found, researched or been taught by their mentors, before being recorded in their spellbooks. Therefore, if recent adventures have meant things being lean on the spell discovery front, then it might be time to visit the college. However, as with the real world, college isn't cheap. We are told that tuition fees at the Great School of Magic are five ducats per day per level of student. The amount of time that a student must study to receive their spell is three weeks plus one week for each level of experience, including the one they're just about to gain. So let's demonstrate this properly to make it clear. A first level magic user, let's call him Merlin Jr., who has obtained enough experience points to become second level, goes to the Great School of Magic to learn a new spell. At this stage, he is still first level. To gain his level and his spell, he must study for the standard three weeks plus a week for each level he is, and a week for the level he will gain. A total of 5 weeks. 5 times 7 is 35 days, and at a rate of 5 ducats per day, because he is still first level, Merlin Jr. must spend a total of 35 times 5 ducats, totaling 175 ducats to complete his tuition. On completion, Merlin Jr. will receive a new spell and be second level. The rules state that if a student wishes to spend more than a minimum time studying, then the tutor may be more generous with the spells that he may be taught. I take this to mean that if Merlin Jr. wants to spend a few more weeks at college, at a rate I would now judge to be 10 ducats a day due to being second level, he may learn an extra spell. No limit is suggested, so you could either limit it yourself or allow the student to study as much as they like, as long as they have the cash. I don't see anything wrong with either, to be honest. Okay, so whilst Merlin Jr. was studying hard for his spell, he elected to do a complementary course. The rules state that it is assumed the student will acquire full knowledge of the course when he achieves next level, the course fees being included in the standard tuition fees. Here is a list of the courses on offer. Let's say that Merlin Jr. took a course on agility training whilst learning his new spell. On achieving second level, not only does Merlin Jr. have a new spell, he has also learned to be agile and now able to move and cast spells at the same time, although not without the potential for it all to go wrong. I really like the availability of the expanded information around spell acquisition for magic users and elves. It was a bit ambiguous in the rule books, which isn't always a bad thing, but this system offers a framework that can be mirrored in other areas of the world. In addition, the complementary courses offer another dimension to these classes that improves them without making them overpowered. I love the Conjure Companion option, which is clearly a development of the mechanic for familiars that was included in the advanced Dungeons & Dragons game. What I particularly like about it is how inextricably linked to the caster it is, so much so that the death of a companion causes significant hit point loss and the inability to conjure another companion for a year. Clearly a companion is far from disposable and should be treasured. I think that if I have any criticism of the complementary courses system, it would be that there are too few courses. You could potentially learn all of them by 8th level, but perhaps that's deliberate, as by 9th level a character achieves the official title of wizard and qualifies for a diploma, enabling them to enter the political arena. 
It does make me wonder if Dungeon Masters made up their own courses though, just to offer more variety. If you did, let me know in the comments. Also, I can't help looking at these abilities and thinking how they might have informed future game development in respect of the feats mechanic. Again, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Do they look similar to contemporary feats to you? The chapter on the Great School of Magic also introduces us to new ways for wizards to obtain experience. I'll not go through all the information here, but suffice to say wizards are rewarded more for finding and researching spells and creating magic items than they are for defeating monsters and finding gold. I think this is a great idea, although perhaps difficult to work through for experience gained in a party. Still, the mechanic is here if you want to take advantage of it, and I think it's a great idea. Why shouldn't a scholar be rewarded for doing scholarly things? It just makes sense. On the subject of creating magical items, and indeed spells, we are offered four pages of mechanics on how this might be achieved. A quick read of these makes it clear that item creation is a costly pastime, both financially and the time spent on it. I commented on this subject in my video about the rules cyclopedia, but it's worth repeating that item creation can make the aging mechanic necessary sooner than you think. I guess time flies when you're having fun. Putting aside the dad joke, the information about item creation given in this gazette here more or less reflects that in the rules cyclopedia, but as the rules cyclopedia came out four years later, I would refer to that information if you have it. If not, nothing will be broken. What Gaz3 does have though is a useful quick reference table for generic enchantment costs, and also a wonderful bit of information about how a wizard might create their own library to support the research they do. Wizards do tend to live quite isolated lives, so they probably do not want to have to leave their towers very often. Essentially, what we have here are numerous mechanics for wizard characters to build an environment around themselves. It's another example of a Beckme minigame, where a player could be designing their library or working out what's needed to create different kinds of items, and how much all this might cost. It's incredibly geeky and probably easily portable to a spreadsheet these days, but once upon a time we used to enjoy filling up copious amounts of notepaper, working out this kind of information, whether it was useful or not. At least I did. Please tell me it wasn't only me in the comments. Turning back to the Great School of Magic, perhaps the most interesting feature is the availability of what are called the Seven Secret Crafts of Glantry which in my opinion is one of the most interesting wizard specialist mechanics I've ever seen in all editions of Dungeons & Dragons. Wizards attending the Great School of Magic may specialise in one of seven philosophies, called Crafts in the Gazetteer. Knowledge of the existence of these crafts must be learned before access to them may be earned, by a sponsor who then facilitates a character in joining. A character learning a craft is called a disciple. The seven secret crafts of Glantry are Alchemy, which is the manipulation of the matter and energy of ingredients and compounds, Dracology, which is the study of dragons, Elementalism, is dealing with elemental forces of nature, Illusionism, is influencing what people sense by affecting their minds, Necromancy, is the science of the dead, Cryptomancy, is about the true identity of nature and how to manipulate it, and Witchcraft, the making of potions and charms, amongst other things. Each craft is divided into five circles of power, with only one person, known as the High Master, occupying the fifth circle. Each circle has a number of abilities that may be learned, and access to the next circle may not be attempted until a minimum level is reached. As you can see here, some crafts have more abilities than others, but it's really about the type of wizard you're trying to develop, more than constructing an invincible build. This table supports the system for a wizard wanting to develop in one of the secret crafts. The circle column is self-explanatory, but I'm going to jump to the level column here, which really should be further over to the left, as this is the minimum level a character must be before being allowed to enter the circle. Cycle is the number of days required to learn one ability of the circle, and the cost is the number of ducats required per day to learn the ability. So, a character of the first circle would be expected to pay 14 times 500, that's 7,000 ducats, to learn an ability of the first circle. However, this is far from assured. The player must roll an intelligence check at the end of the study period, rolling under their intelligence for a success. A failed roll means that they've lost their money and must try again. A success means they've learned the ability. However, there's still some way to go. The experience column is the amount of experience the character must earn 
using their new ability before it can be used most effectively. If we jump to the success column, this is the chance of success for using the ability, determined by rolling a D percentile and rolling under the shown amount. If a character has not obtained the required number of experience points using their ability, as shown in the experience column, then the chance of success is halved. In my opinion, this demonstrates a period of consolidation before an ability can be used effectively, which represents, I think, someone working through the kinks of their new skill, which I find quite interesting. The ability is not completely understood when gained, it needs to be practiced. I wonder how popular such a mechanic would be in modern games. The final column is obvious, it is the number of times the ability may be used each day. Crucially, each attempt is to gain just one ability of a particular circle, with some circles having more than one available, and all abilities of a circle must be learned before a character may advance to the next circle. As I mentioned earlier, only one person may occupy the fifth circle and claim to be High Master. So we are told that to obtain this circle, a disciple of the fourth circle must challenge their High Master to a duel, with the victor either winning or keeping their position and the loser having to lead the order. Clearly, attempting to reach the fifth circle comes with huge risks. Okay, so I've talked about the system of gaining abilities by learning one of the seven crafts, but what are these abilities? Well, here we can see examples of the abilities available for two crafts, alchemy and dracology. Hopefully the names should be enough to elicit something close to their meaning, but if you want more information, I advise you obtain a copy of this gazetteer. What's interesting is that Although Dracology has more abilities to gain, access to the higher circles is slowed down by the requirement to obtain all abilities before being allowed to progress. At the end of the day, it's about choice and the kind of wizard you want to play. Regardless, the Seven Secret Crafts of Glantry is a very enjoyable and thought-provoking mechanic, which can enable Dungeon Masters to add a twist to NPC wizards. You may ambush a vulnerable-looking magic user, but when she turns to show her scaly skin and breathes fire on you, well, that's just something else, isn't it? So after all that, I guess it's time to talk about the Radiance. What is it? How does it affect the game? Well, without disappointing you, that's difficult to say without giving away all kinds of spoilers for players and ruining the foreshadowing built up by many Dungeon Masters. So what I will say is that the Radiance is a power source beneath Glantry City that, for want of a better word, radiates an effect across the land that can amplify magic power if you know how to manipulate it. This is why the Order of Radiance is so important. The closer the wizard gains dominion to Glantry City, the more powerful his spells and spellcrafting can be. Utilization of the Radiance is far from safe, but this is offset in the minds of ambitious wizards by the sheer power on offer. Ultimately, the Radiance may facilitate the goal of a campaign in Glantry, so whilst some might not think it worth their time, many will, especially if there is potential for a shortcut to immortality. But if you really want to know more, play a campaign in Glantry. The final 17 pages of this gazetteer contain numerous adventure hooks for running a campaign in Glantry. In total, this consists of 5 basic level adventures, 9 expert level adventures, 3 companion level adventures, and 2 master level. In addition, we are treated to an adventure framed as a sample graduation test for a wizard attempting to reach level 9 at the Great School of Magic. Unusually, this is an adventure for just one player, the undergraduate wizard, so it could even be used competitively if there are a number of wizards in your campaign group at the same time. Who will complete the test most successfully, or more importantly, who will complete the test? The score required has an impact on the wizard's career and political interactions going forward, but most intriguing are the magical keys that may be won within the test that convey powerful bonuses. If you are looking for any motivation for attending the Great School of Magic beyond what I've already mentioned in this video, this should be it. Graduation is certainly not to be sniffed at in Glantry, and given everything that may be learned at the school, it's clear why Glantry and Wizards are renowned and feared across the known world. The final pages of Gaz 3 focuses on what are called Critters from the Cauldron, offering four new monsters for use in your game, although two of them, the Nosferatu and the Vampire Rose, appeared in earlier Beckme editions the Nosferatu in Gaz 1, the Grand Duchy of Garamekos, and the Vampire Rose in B3, Palace of the Silver Princess. The final, final page is player information, centred on the opinions and views of Glantry, as given by four different type of people. 
a dwarven innkeeper, an elven merchant, a sorcerer from the Great School of Magic, and a retired thief putting his feet up in Eärendi. These offer interesting perspectives and more than a few easter eggs if you're able to read between the lines. Ultimately, they work as a vehicle to introduce players to playing in Glantry, or even for just passing through, enriching the variety of the known world even more. So with that, I close the book on Gaz 3, The Principalities of Glantry, all 96 pages of it. So, what do I think? Well, putting aside the content for a moment, the colloquial style I referred to earlier does take up quite a bit of word count, and may not be to everyone's taste. I got tired of it at times, and just wanted to get to the important information. That said, it could be viewed as a light-hearted attempt to engage the reader, whilst communicating context as well as information. What this style does have going for it is the way it introduces certain characters, as it is them speaking to you vicariously through the text, and you, for all intents and purposes, listening and learning. Otherwise, the extended page count is taken full advantage of. We are given a wealth of characters, locations, plot devices, and tools to enable Dungeon Masters to run immersive campaigns. In addition, player characters are given options for developing their magic users and elves that are not available anywhere else, and Glantry City is the beating heart of it all, with its Great School of Magic, Bickering Wizard Council, and of course, the Radiance. So, given this gazetteer was bold enough to set itself some goals, why don't we see if it met them? Provide a route way to immortality? Check. New options for playing magic users and elves? Check. An environment where magic is dominant and prominent and can be explored? Check, check, check. Objectives achieved. Well, Gaz 3, The Principalities of Glantry, is a wonderful product, even if I have to forgive it for not having a scale on the A1 map of the country. Apart from this small oversight, there's nothing much else to criticise, even if I am overly harsh on the colloquial style. Like I've said many times, I wish I had more time to run more games, because running one in Glantry looks like a lot of fun. And even if you want to take your campaign elsewhere, there's plenty here to dip into for inspiration, such as the Seven Crafts or Secret Organisations. I think it would be very difficult to find anyone who isn't satisfied with this book. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please like and subscribe if you think I deserve your future attention as I continue my trip through the Gazetteers. If you enjoyed this video and wish to say thank you and support my channel further, then please consider buying me a coffee, link on the screen and in the description. Otherwise, I'm Beckme Berserker, keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.